Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this video we are going to be looking at rocks and obviously I'm sure you understand rocks is a very very large topic so obviously we're going to have to split this one into two parts. So let's get going on part one. Okay, so let's get this key point out of the way right from the beginning. Rocks consist of one or more minerals. Minerals are not made of rocks. I know it seems like a stupid thing to say, but you will not believe the amount of people that get that mixed up. Okay, so let's just get that one down right from the start. So, as I'm sure you remember, rocks are split into three groups. We have igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and then we have the fourth group, hydrothermal rocks. Now, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, they're fine. Hydrothermal is one of the one of the situations where you have a group which you could argue over. Now, hydrothermal essentially means hot water. So hydrothermal rocks are produced by the circulation of hot water in the Earth's crust. And essentially hydrothermal rocks are the types of rocks which are produced when that hot water interacts with a rock, producing a new rock in the process. Now you can say, okay, that means it's you know, that process is producing a completely new rock type. So you can say, right definitely its own individual groups there are four types you could also argue though that most hydrothermal processes are driven by either igneous processes metamorphic processes or sedimentary processes so you could say well the new rock that's being created is part of an igneous process therefore it's technically an igneous hydrothermal rock or the rock new rock being created is due to a metamorphic process so it's a metamorphic hydrothermal rock and same with sedimentary so Depending on how you feel, you can say that there are four different types of rock, or you could say there are three different types of rock. And it's just a matter of personal opinion as to, you know, which one you go for. Okay, so here's our rock cycle. All right, so we've seen this before. We know it's a very, very simplified diagram. So let's just run through the basics nonetheless. So here's our exposed rock. It gets weathered, eroded producing a sediment which gets transported, eventually that transported sediment gets deposited, obviously forming a layer, that layer gets buried deeper and deeper and deeper, temperature and pressure increase, the layer gets compacted, it's cemented and obviously eventually it will lithify to form a sedimentary rock, so we're here now. A couple of things can happen, well number one we can uplift that sedimentary rock, expose it at the surface and then erode it and then start the cycle again. Or we can take that sedimentary rock, we can bury it, we can increase pressure and temperature, and eventually that sedimentary rock will metamorphose. So now we have a metamorphic rock. Once again, two things can happen. It can either be uplifted and eroded, cycle starts again, or we can take that metamorphic rock and we can keep increasing the temperature. And eventually, if we increase the temperature far enough, the metamorphic rock will melt, producing a magma. And then there's a couple of things that can happen to that magma. Well, either the magma gets stuck in the crust, it crystallizes, and so you have a something like a granite, for instance, and eventually that granite then gets uplifted, eroded, uh, uplifted, exposed, and eroded. Well, the other option, of course, is that the magma rises towards the surface, is erupted in the form of lava, that cools, forms a new rock, while that rock is on the surface of the earth, so therefore it's exposed, gets weathered, eroded, producing a sediment, and the cycle starts again. Now, as I said, this is a very simplified diagram, and it doesn't really, you know, cover a lot of what's going on, you know. So, you know, th this isn't a, a hard and fast diagram. So, nonetheless, you can see that the cycle is a closed system. Every time we destroy something, we're creating something to take its place. Okay, so now let's have a think about igneous rocks. So igneous rocks are split into two groups. The first group are the intrusive igneous rocks, also referred to as the plutonic igneous rocks. Now these igneous rocks have coarse to medium crystals, so you can see them with your naked eye. And they are formed when magma cools slowly in the Earth's crust. And because that magma is cooling slowly, it gives the crystals plenty of time to grow, hence the fact they are coarse to medium in size. At the other end of the scale, we have the extrusive or volcanic igneous rocks. Now, they, are, they have fine crystals, or they're actually a glass, they have no crystals at all. 
and they're formed by very rapid crystallization at the surface of the Earth. Now, the surface of the Earth means both the continents and the seafloor. Now, obviously, because this lava is cooling so fast, it doesn't give crystals time to form, in which case you would have a glass. Or if it does give crystals time to form, those crystals don't have time to grow, so they're going to end up being very, very fine. Either way, you cannot see the crystals in an extrusive igneous rock. So straight away, when we look at an igneous rock, we can split it into these two groups instantly, depending on can we see the crystals or can't we see the crystals. OK, so let's think about magma. So magma is essentially molten rock. In order to make magma, you have to melt a rock. Now, magma is also referred to as melt. So every once in a while, if I accidentally say the term melt instead of magma, you know what I mean. Now, most magmas are dominated by silicon because you know, all the most of the major rocks in Earth are dominated by silicate minerals. So when you melt those rocks, you are going to get a silicon-dominated magma. So it's going to be a silicate magma, it's called. Now, the vast majority of magmas are generated at depth, and they're due to a number of processes such as deep burial, subduction, or mantle melting. And we're actually going to cover those processes later on. Now, if a magma erupts onto the surface of the Earth, it's called a lava. I'm sure you remember that. And this is the most important one, though. The, the, the uh, melt composition and the temperature of that magma controls the types and composition of the minerals that will form from it. Okay, So you can only form the minerals which are stable under the conditions of the magma. So, for instance, if you have a stupidly hot magma, let's say 1,400 degrees Celsius, you can't start crystallizing low temperature minerals from it. It's just impossible. The temperature's too high. Those minerals wouldn't be stable. Also, if your magma is full of you know, magnesium and iron, well, obviously, you're going to create minerals which are rich in magnesium and iron. You know, you're not going to suddenly start creating minerals which are rich, minerals which are rich in sodium and potassium because there's just not very much of it in your magma. So the composition of your magma and the temperature of your magma have a very very major control over the minerals you get, and obviously that's going to affect what type of igneous rock you have. Okay, so if we look at this diagram, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're going to focus on this top portion right here. So, if you remember, igneous rocks are split into four groups. Felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. So, these are types of magma, felsic, intermediate, mafic, ultramafic. They're also types of rock. Now, for each of these types of magma, we have a classic volcanic rock and a classic plutonic rock associated with that type of magma. So, let's look at the volcanic rocks. If we have a felsic magma and it crystallizes quickly, it forms a rhyolite. Intermediate will give you an andesite, mafic a basalt, and ultramafic a camartite. If you allow your magmas to cool slowly, so you have a plutonic rock, a felsic magma gives you a granite, intermediate, diorite, mafic, gabbro, ultramafic, peridotite. Now, Underneath this, you can see we have this diagram, and it's showing you, you know, the major minerals you would expect to have in your rock. So the question is, what's affecting the minerals you would expect to get? Well, if we come down to the bottom here, we can see we have temperature, which is the pink arrow. So over here at the felsic end of the scale, we have a kind of like minimum magma temperature of around 700 Celsius. Over here at the ultramafic end of the scale, we have a maximum temperature of, a one, of around 1,400 Celsius. So you can see, number one, the types of minerals you get are going to reflect you know, the temperatures. At this end of the scale, you're going to have low temperature minerals. At this end of the scale, you're obviously going to have high temperature minerals. Then we have the change in composition. So as we go from felsic to ultramafic, we have increasing concentrations of iron, magnesium, and calcium. This obviously means at this end of the scale, we're going to have minerals which are rich in iron, magnesium, and calcium. If you go the other way, from ultramafic to felsic, what you have is an increase in sodium and potassium. There's also some other stuff like aluminum as well, actually, come to think of it. And so that means as you go towards this end of the scale, you start seeing more minerals which are rich in sodium, potassium, aluminum, and silicon. 
So the composition and the temperature is going to affect what you get. So an ultramafic magma, remember, high temperature, lots of iron and magnesium, that means you're going to get a rock dominated by olivine and pyroxene because those two minerals fit the criteria. Mafic rocks, well, they're quite rich in iron, magnesium and calcium, so we're going to get uh, a rock that contains lots of pyroxene, quite a lot of calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar, and maybe a little bit of olivine. Intermediate rocks are going to be dominated by plagioclase feldspar. They're going to have muscovite, biotite and amphibole, and maybe just a little bit of quartz, maybe. And at this end of the scale, we're now at the lowest temperature, largest amount of sodium and potassium. Well, now all of a sudden we start getting low temperature potassium minerals like uh, potassium feldspar appearing. We obviously get quartz, which is a very silicon rich mineral because it's nothing but silicon. We have sodium plagioclase feldspar, there's the sodium. We also have muscovite, biotite and amphibole appearing. Those are our, those are our ferromagnesian phases in this case. So you can see the type of minerals we're getting is a reflection of temperature and composition. And obviously the types of mineral we have are, you know, essentially allow us to classify the rock that we've got. So if I see I've got my rock and it's absolutely stuffed with olivine, well it clearly can't be from a felsic magma, can it? Olivine forms at high temperatures with and magma with large amounts of iron and magnesium. So as soon as I see the olivine, I know what type of magma it must have formed from. It's just basic common sense. Now in order to get even more information, we have this diagram here. Now, this is the Bowen's reaction series, and, and it's very similar to the other diagram, but uh, it has a, a couple of differences to it. Now, obviously, on this side, once again, we have magma temperature, so we have high at this end and low at this end. So if you remember, that's going to be going from about 1,400 degrees Celsius here to around 700 degrees Celsius here. So we have quite a temperature range. You will also see that we have ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic here. So we have our different magma, magma types. Obviously, once again, very, very rich in iron, magnesium, and calcium at this end of the scale. Very, very rich in sodium, potassium, aluminum, and silicon at this end of the scale. So what do we see? Well, we see ultramafic rocks. Well, we can see they're going to be rich in olivine because we have the arrow there. They're going to have a little bit of pyroxene and they're going to have some calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar. Now, the nice thing about the Bowen's reaction series is that the amount of the arrow in the field gives you some idea of you know, what relative proportions to expect in your rock. So if we look at this ultramafic rock, well, we have a huge amount of the olivine arrow in the field. So that means ultramafic rocks are going to naturally be very olivine-rich on the whole. There will also be a lesser amount of pyroxene and a lesser amount of calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar. Now, this doesn't always hold true. There are some types of ultramafic rock which are called pyroxenites, and they're dominated by pyroxene. You know, they have a very, very substantial pyroxene component to the rock. So, obviously, that rule doesn't hold true 100% of the time. But we're talking generally, you would expect most ultramafic rocks to have a very, very high olivine content with lesser pyroxene and calcium rich plagioclase feldspar. For a mafic magma, well, what would we expect the mineral composition to be? Well, obviously, we can see we expect lots of pyroxene, because the pyroxene arrow fills the entire field, lots of plagioclase feldspar, more at the calcium end of the scale, a little olivine, maybe some amphibole, and maybe a, a tiny, tiny amount of biotite. Intermediate magmas, well, what would, he, what would we expect in those? We'd expect lots of plagioclase feldspar, this time more towards the sodium end of the scale, quite a lot of biotite, quite a lot of amphibole, and maybe under certain rare conditions, a little bit of pyroxene sneaking in as well. And then at this end of the scale, at the felsic end, we have potassium feldspar, muscovite and quartz, and maybe a little amphibole, biotite, or sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar can sneak in as well. So the amount of each arrow in the field gives you some idea of what the relative proportions are going to be. The Bowen's reaction series obviously also tells you, you know, which ones are the higher temperature minerals and which ones are the lower temperature minerals. And so it's showing you the progression of minerals as you go from high temperature over here to low temperature down here. So it's showing you, for instance, the ferromagnesium minerals here, olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, and biotite. It's showing you which ones will be stable at the higher temperatures and which ones will be stable at the lower temperatures.
So I personally prefer the Bowen's reaction series over this type of diagram here because I find this diagram a little bit clunky, whereas I find the Bowen's reaction series just quite a lot more clear cut in you know what it's trying to tell you. So igneous rocks are separated based on their crystal size, as we've just discussed. So they essentially come in three varieties: fine, coarse, and very coarse. And these are the sizes of crystals in millimeters. So fine crystals will be less than one millimeter. Coarse crystals will be equal than equal to or greater than one millimeter. And very coarse crystals will be equal to or greater than 20 millimeters. So it's typically a little bit tricky to start seeing minerals which are less than one millimeter in size, purely because you know rocks are generally quite messy things in terms of the minerals they have there, and you know it's quite difficult to you know, easily see anything that's about one millimeter. So once you're at this kind of scale, yeah, you're not going to be able to see the crystals very, very easily. Once you're above one millimeter, you can start to see the crystal. So you know that, that's about the boundary of where you can easily see stuff. Now, igneous rocks that have these fine crystals, which you can't see with the naked eye, they're classified as aphanitic. If you have a coarse igneous rock, so the crystals are greater than one millimeter, but less than 20 millimeters, that's going to be phaneritic. Now, when you have an igneous rock that has very, very coarse crystals, so greater than 20 millimeters, so larger than two centimeters, that's going to be a pegmatite. So that's going to be a pegmatitic igneous rock. So in the case of pegmatitic and phaneritic igneous rocks, you can obviously see the crystals of your naked eye. So they will be classified as intrusive or plutonic. The magma cooled slowly. At the other end of the scale, we have these fine crystals. You cannot see them naked eye, therefore aphanitic. And so that means the rock is obviously going to be extrusive or volcanic, depending on what term you want to use. So here we go. Here's a few examples. So obviously here we have a, a volcanic igneous rock. It's a piece of basalt. So you can see when you look at this, no crystals are easily visible. You can only start seeing them when you look down a microscope like we have here. So here we have ourselves a nice bit of granite. You can see the crystals are nice and clear. So you can see this, you know, nice uh, potassium feldspar crystal here. You can see, you know, all these crystals around here. You can see the black biotype as well. So, you know, that's obviously a, a plutonic igneous rock. You can see the crystals and the crystals are somewhere between about one and two centimeters, uh, sorry, one millimeter and 20 millimeters in, in length. So in size, should I say? So that means it's going to be classified as a coarse igneous rock. So we're going to classify it as phaneritic. Now, when we come onto this uh, picture over here, this is a picture of someone's countertop, you can see over here we have a granite very similar to this one here. Now it's been polished, so the crystals are a little bit more visible. However, you can see quite clearly within this piece of granite here, you can see we have this big, much coarser bit of rock. So in this instance, these crystals are in excess of 20 millimeters. So what we have here is we have ourselves a pegmatitic igneous rock within the boundaries that I've drawn. So these are your three different types of igneous rock based on size. So we're, we're splitting up our igneous rocks based on crystal size. We're also splitting them up based on the magmas they form from. Hence the fact we split our igneous rocks based on coarse crystals, plutonic, and fine crystals, volcanic. So any other interesting terms? Well, yes, you lucky people, there are many. So if we have an igneous rock that consists of crystals that are the same size, it is termed equigranular. So a lot of the ultramathic igneous rocks, the peridotites that come from the Earth's mantle, they are very, very equigranular rocks. You look at them down a microscope, you'll see all the crystals of olivine in them are nearly all exactly the same size. It's quite amazing, actually. So that would be a great example of a nice equigranular igneous rock. Now, another term that turns up quite a lot is the term porphyritic. So porphyritic simply means you have two different sizes of crystal. So you'll have one larger crystal, and that larger crystal will be sitting in a matrix or ground mass of much smaller crystals. And the term porphyritic can apply to volcanic rocks like this andesite here, or it can apply to plutonic rocks like this granite here. 
In both these instances, we can see we have some crystals which are noticeably larger than the ground mass. So here we have these nice large crystals of uh, plagioclase, uh, sorry, not plagioclase, uh, potassium feldspar right here. And you'll notice they are significantly larger than the other crystals. So you use this crystal of biotite, for, inst for instance, as a guide. You can see it's much, much smaller than the larger crystals here. And the same goes for this rock over here. In this case, you can see we actually have two different types of large crystal. We have these darker gray ones, and we have these creamy white ones. But nevertheless, you can see we have these much larger crystals sitting in a much finer ground mass. Okay, so the larger crystals are termed phenocrysts, and the smaller crystals that surround them are obviously the ground mass. Now, this texture is the result of what's referred to as two-stage cooling. So this means the magma didn't just cool in one event, it actually occurred in two separate steps, sorry, cooled in two separate steps. So what does this actually mean? Well, here we go. This is a truly amazing diagram. I hope you're in awe of it. I drew it myself. Um, what we have here is we have a situation where we have a magma chamber deep in the earth and our magma chamber is cooling nice and slowly. And eventually our cooling magma chamber makes it to a temperature where it starts to crystallize out minerals. And so that's what it does. We start seeing some silicate minerals forming in the magma chamber. In this case, they're the, the gray squares. And obviously, because it's cooling slowly underground, those crystals have time to grow, they have space to grow, they start getting quite large. Now, as the magma moves up through the crust, obviously, some of these uh, grey squares get swept up along with the magma, and they get carried to higher levels. Once again, magma keeps cooling down, maybe another silicate mineral starts crystallizing out, in this case, the green circles. And so, once again, though, we have a nice ball of magma in the crust, it's cooling slowly, so the green circle minerals have time to grow. Once on the uh, grey square minerals have even more time to grow, so they're getting even bigger at this point. So now we have these nice big crystals floating in this silicate magma. So now what's going to happen? Well, obviously, eventually some of that silicate magma is going to be pushed towards the surface. And so when that silicate magma gets pushed towards the surface, it's going to be erupted in the form of lava. So the, the lava is going to contain the silicate magma, the liquid portion, but it's also going to contain these nice coarse crystals of the gray squares mineral and the green circle mineral. And so what's going to happen is that, that lava is going to cool down very, very fast, creating lots and lots of fine crystals. And so the grey stuff here, that's your lava flow, consisting of these very, very fine crystals. But within this lava flow, you will see we also have these much coarser crystals, the grey squares and the green circles. And so this is what we mean by two-stage cooling. All it's saying is, is we have one stage of cooling underground, where we have these larger crystals forming, and then we have a second stage of cooling when the lava gets erupted onto the surface of the earth and the lava cools very, very fast. And both of these stages are distinct from one another, and so they produce different sized crystals. And so that's it. That's all that uh, porphyritic texture really is. It just says my magma cooled slowly at one point and then a little bit faster later on. And that's the same thing with this granite here. So imagine this situation where we have this deeper magma chamber cooling slowly starts creating these in this case let's let's say potassium feldspar crystals so the gray squares will be potassium feldspar and then that magma some of it gets pushed towards a, a higher level magma chamber the potassium feldspar crystals go with it and because at a higher level in the crust it's slightly colder and so this magma here is cooling down much faster than this magma here and so although it has time to cool down slowly, so you do get these visible crystals, it cools down more quickly. And so it ends up forming this much finer ground mass, whereas these potassium feldspar crystals, which form down here, are noticeably larger. Once again, two-stage cooling. Okay, so in terms of igneous rock classification, once again, here are three uh, three type, four types of magma, felsic, intermediate, mafic and ultramafic. Sometimes if you look in different textbooks, you might actually find the term acid associated with felsic, basic towards mafic and ultra basic towards ultramafic. These terms here, acid, basic and ultra basic are old fashioned terms. They're not really used anymore. They've been replaced by felsic, mafic and ultramafic. 
So anyway, so let's just go through the table here. What do we have? Well, we can see that we have the four types of magma. We can see the temperature ranges associated with each type of magma. We can see the amount of silicon, uh, sorry, silica, SiO2. We can see that felsic igneous rocks have lots and lots of, well, felsic igneous magma, sorry, have a lot of silica. And so you can create very, very silica hungry minerals, things like, you know, potassium feldspar, things like uh, muscovite, biotite. And of course, quartz. Quartz is the most silica hungry mineral because quartz is SiO2, nothing but silica. Now, as we move from felsic to, to ultramafic, you will notice the amount of silica is steadily decreasing. So that means by the time we're at the ultramafic end of the spectrum, the minerals you're forming you know, have less silica to work with, so they have to be more silica conservative. And once again, that's another reason you form a mineral like olivine. Olivine doesn't take much silica to make, and so it's a very good mineral for the situation. Now, we also have to think about the volatile content. Now, volatile means gases, and the most common gas in magmas is, of course, water vapor. So when we look at the table here, what can we see? Well, we can see that felsic igneous rocks can in some cases be up to 10% volatile. Now, that's a very, very high upper limit. But nevertheless, that is a significant quantity of volatiles, and that's obviously going to affect how the magma behaves. At the other end of the scale, an ultramafic magma has less than 1% volatile. So that's very, very volatile poor. And so that's obviously going to affect how the magma erupted. So if you remember when you were doing earlier courses, you will know that felsic and intermediate magmas are associated with explosive volcanism. And that's because you have these high volatile concentrations. So they are very, very commonly associated with volcanoes that tend to form quite a lot of pyroclastic material due to the explosion and all the bits of magma getting thrown up into the air it creates lots and lots of ash, for instance. In contrast, at the other end of the scale, we have mafic and ultramafic uh, magmas. And obviously, when they're erupted onto the surface of the Earth, those eruptions tend to be quite gentle because there's you know, quite a low volatile content. And that means that what you get in these situations is you tend to have volcanic eruptions which are dominated by lava flows. So at this end of the scale, you've got vol volcanic eruptions which are more dominated by pyroclastics, the part of the eruption caused during the explosive phase. So the types of rocks produced uh, due to the explosive phase of the eruption. However, at this end of the scale, well, there's no explosive phase. So if you don't have the explosive phase, you obviously can't start forming the pyroclastic flows or pyroclastic material, should I say. And so instead, what you have is you have volc uh, volcanism dominated by lava flows instead. Now, obviously, this is also going to affect the types of minerals that you get. Obviously, you have lots and lots of water in your magma. Well, when you start forming minerals, some of the minerals you form are obviously going to have water in them. At the other end of the scale, an ultramafic magma, very, very water poor. And so the minerals you form will not have water in them because there's just not much water there. In terms of the viscosity of the magma, well, typically the higher the amount of silica, silica, yes, yeah, sorry, got myself confused there. The higher the amount of silica, the thicker your magma will be. So the lower the amount of silica, the thinner it will be, the more easily it will flow. That's also a, a reflection of temperature as well. The higher the temperature, the, f the more easily something will flow. The lower the temperature, the more difficult it is for that liquid to flow. And so essentially what we have here is at the ultramafic end, we have a very hot magma with a very low silica content, so it flows very, very easily. At the other end of the scale, we have a very cool magma with a very high silica content, so it flows with difficulty. And when we look at the basic compositions, what do we see? Well, we see at this end of the scale, ultramafic rocks are dominated by magnesium and iron. Mafic rocks contain significant quantities of calcium, magnesium and iron. Intermediate rocks, well, they're intermediate by their nature, so they kind of have this intermediate composition. You know, quite a, some silicon, some sodium, some potassium, but also some calcium and some aluminum. And at the felsic end of the scale, we have magmas which are dominated by silicon, sodium, and potassium. And so that's obviously going to affect the types of minerals which we get, because obviously the minerals that form will be a reflection of the chemistry and the magma temperature. So 
we can all we can see how all these things are working together to you know produce different types of rocks with different types of compositions and different types of minerals so here we go so if we look at the common plutonic rocks again so we have felsic intermediate mafic and ultramafic so we can see here we have ourselves in all these instances actually we can see we have the crystals they're all nice and visible there so we're definitely dealing with plutonic rocks otherwise known as intrusive rocks and we can also see there's a noticeable change in color going from light here to darker over here now um, we can see we're going from kind of a light pink to a kind of 50 50 dark minerals and light minerals here to a gabbro which you can see is quite a dark gray so obviously we have increasing quantities of uh, ferromagnesium minerals now once we come to the peridotite here You'll notice that it's you know got these beautiful olivine crystals with this lovely apple green color so it doesn't actually look that dark when compared to the gabbro but it is quite a dark rock nevertheless so you know the minerals in this case are making it not look quite as dark as it you know could do we also have this pyroxenite here by the way which is a pyroxene dominated igneous rock in this case you can see that it's a very very dark color there so anyway uh, Going back, through this, going back through the different types of rocks. So if we have a felsic magma that cools slowly, we get a granite. If we have an intermediate magma that cools slowly, we get ourselves a diorite. If we have a mafic magma that cools slowly, we get a gabbro. And if we have an ultramafic magma that cools slowly, we end up with a peridotite. Okay. Now the term peridotite is a bucket term. So peridotite includes several different types of rock. So it includes things like dunites, lertzolites, peroxonites. They are all put together under the term peridotite, just for simplicity's sake. Okay, so this is going to be a good place to stop. So pause the video, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, you know, chat to somebody for a couple of minutes, and then come back when you're feeling ready. All right, see you in a bit.